why vol spikes harder than price ever could. Hmm. So profound. Why do you think it does? Why do I think vol spikes high, uh, harder? Vol spikes harder than price? Oh, because price has a premium to it. You know, like there's uh, there's time factor to it. So I think that mm. that's what I think. Well, that's good. But we'll see. And just the the F. I mean, are you talking about aspect. options here? No, no, just in general, like vol spikes versus price spikes, because you usually have vol expand a multiple of what price actually does. So, like, you know, you get a ten percent vol's up five percent right now. Market's down one to quarter percent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Why do you think volatility expands more? You think it's just like perpetual fear, fear, fear driven? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Fear is always overstated. Yeah. Don't you think we'd we'd all learn that fear is always overstated? Like, like you know, the meteor can only hit once. You know, that sort of thing. Like, uh, but the media hits a lot of times in the market. It's not uh, It's not like humanity, unfortunately. I mean, yes, so the S&P is down 80. <laughs> 81. Pain. Implied volatility and price returns of an underlying are two main changing factors that affect the price of an option. This goes to what we uh, talked about with Delta on the option drive today, which was another great one. You know, there's a lot of factors that change option prices. You can't, there's no basic formula that you can do rough back of the hand, you know, X, X plus Y equals Z. There's a lot of variables here and they change second to second. Sure. Right now, when you're looking at the markets, the price is what it is. It can change the next second. And so you have to understand that and be comfortable with that variable here. Um, but we're going to isolate kind of volatility and price here. So because volatility and price returns are probabilistic in nature, meaning that there is no certainty, there um, is no certainty where volatility will end up tomorrow or what stocks will do tomorrow. You always have that, that uncertainty baked into uh, markets. It would help to know what their possible range of values are, i.e. their distributions. So we're going to be talking about distributions of volatility and price and seeing if we can uh, gather some some intel here um, on the SPX. So let's do it. Let's take a look here. We're looking 2020 to present. So we're looking at five years of data here. We're looking at SPX. We're looking at IV, which is implied volatility, the actual implied volatility of the underlying, which we typically look at at a 30-day uh, time frame. And then we're looking at IVR. So the IVR is the relative range of, of the underlying's implied volatility. It's the context to tell you what IV is relative to its range. Is it high or low? It's, it's you know, one of those things when, when we created IVR and IV percentile as well, you know, those things are a measure of, of the, the IV number itself. If I told you implied volatility is 50%, that doesn't tell you whether it's high or low. It, right. It's it's high relative to SPY, SPY or SPX volatility is usually- We're comparing high. apples to oranges. This, but you don't know right. what the, the, without knowing the range of implied volatility, you can't say whether the IV number is high or low. And that's what IVR does for us here. So we're looking at IV, which is the underlying implied volatility and the implied volatility rank. We recorded the SPX price returns. And then we looked at the VIX IVR divergence. So we're looking at- how high volatility is relative to where IV rank is in SPX. And so we're going to see what why vol spikes harder than prices in this analysis here. Very good. And so this next one, price returns are roughly normal, uh, are normally distributed with some kurtosis and slightly negative tail skew. And so this is what you'll see. With Don't look now, your NASDAQ's 580. Ooh. You bought them at 526. You bought them at 542. We'll oh, no, you bought them uh, at right, 586 and uh, 581. Good job of you. Oh, it's small. I mean, I need to lighten up the position a little bit. Got a little gung-ho. Boom, boom. Psh, psh, psh. <laughs> you had a little little gung-ho. Yes, you did. Uh, gold uh, back up, uh, well, down 11 uh, yeah. up off of its lows. And even the S&Ps have rallied about 25 handles. The down 60 volatility uh flirting with 22 still up 85 cents that's a four percent move as opposed to a five percent move which i just quoted a couple of minutes ago um so this is what you typically see with prices in in major uh, indices mm -hmm. right this is why put skew exists is because you typically see you know pretty normal distribution with much wider tails to the downside you usually 
you usually see these bigger moves to the downside, which is why you have that downside skew in equity markets. Um, and, and so you see this negative tail to the downside here. Um, that's pretty standard. Jumping over to the next slide here. Um, so here, volatility, however, is distributed with what is called a chi-square fashion. Oh, did you chi. know chi-square? No, I had no idea. I didn't. I didn't either. This means, though, that volatility cannot go below zero, of course, and has a large, noticeable positive skew. And so you have a uh, inverse correlation here and an inverse skew. Volatility has upside all skew because it explodes higher mm -hmm. and, and equities have downside put skew because you typically see the bigger moves to the downside. And you could see, you know, that, that volatility, if you look at volatility futures or, vol or like if you're looking at VIX options, there's tons of upside skew. And that's because of what you're seeing here, these occurrences where, you know, the VIX has these really big tails and it can only go so low. Um, there's a baked in floor here. It, there is a floor because there can't be zero. Right. Premium. You know, so there is a floor here. So you have this upside tail skew in volatility futures. Well said. Uh, next slide here. So the main difference between the two distributions is price returns are essentially symmetrical around zero and have a roughly have roughly an equal chance of having an up or down move on a day to day basis. When you look at that distribution, it's basically 50 50 when you talk about over long periods of time, you do have that uh, positive drift to market. So it's about 52, 48 in terms of, um, you know, you're, when you look at the long term, and that's that's why markets are higher now than they were in previous, you know, years, mm -hmm. uh, is because you have that positive drift to the upside. Volatility tends to cluster around its median, median of around 15, but when it moves big, it moves big to the upside almost exclusively. You don't see these five or 10 point hand, uh, 10 handle moves to the downside in the VIX. I don't, I don't, unless it's very, very high. It happens after, you know, reaching a high. So you, you, you have that price skew to the upside in the VIX um, itself. How does this divergence between the VIX and IVR behave when measured across trading days? Uh, in other words, how do you change, how do changes in the VIX compare to shifts in implied volatility rank over time and what can this divergence tell us about the market conditions. So now we're kind of tying together VIX and IVR itself to give you an idea of like, you know, is there a period, is there a time where, you know, you've got high volatility, but also high IV rank. So high volatility relative to itself. Is there a sweet spot? That's what we're kind of looking at here. So jump into the next slide here. So most days show negative divergence. So this is where IVR is greater than the VIX. So the VIX number, because it stays clustered, it typically stays in a range and, and IVR will fluctuate in a much uh, uh, much more than the VIX itself. The VIX will stay at 15, 16, 17 for long periods of time. But when it spikes, you see that divergence. So indicating that option markets remain ele elevated after VIX cools down. So you typically do see uh, premiums stay, you know, uh, stay relatively high even when fall comes in. That's correct. It usually takes a little bit of time. Like everybody, even though volatility is coming in, market wants to see that volatility coming in is warranted. So it's not a one-to-one -one linear thing. So positive divergence. So when the VIX is greater than the, the IV rank is rare, but marks panic moments when fear spikes faster than option pricing. So this is and – and you can't really trade this. It's very, it's very hard to, to trade this. VIX greater than IVR because it's you, you have to be in the moment. It's yes. not something you can play for into the future because you have all these components like drag that that you know affect option prices. You can't like play for this spike in VIX. But no. when it happens, you know, there is some opportunity there. So the the edge that we're kind of looking at here is selling premium when IVR is greater than the VIX. So this is this typically happens after the spike in the VIX. So you have the spike in the VIX, implied volatility remains kind of sticky, but comes down a little bit. Um, and that's because you have that kind of slow, and you can even kind of see it here, when vol spikes, it doesn't go straight back down. It kind correct. of has a slow tail off. And that's kind of your time where you have the spike and you get a little bit of uh, 
So you don't have to catch the top and the bottoms is what you're really looking at here. There's time to do something and everything, right? Like, you know, there's definitely times that you're going to be early and there's definitely times when you're going to be late, but you don't have to hit the top and the bottom. You want that meat in the middle there. You just don't want to ramp up when volatility is extremely low so you don't get that big spike up. That's the biggest cardinal sin you can make. Yes. Yes. FOMO again. Good stuff. Hmm? A um, couple takeaways. So price returns are roughly normally distributed while volatility follows a chi-square distribution. I think that's the first time chi-square has been mentioned on this show. So, uh, the show. It's the first there. time and who, who knew? The main difference between the two are the tails. Price returns are skewed a bit to the downside. So you have bigger, fatter tails on the downside typically, while volatility has a large noticeable upward skew. You have these tails on the upside. This is what markets are. This isn't a shock to anybody. This means if vol goes up, it tends to shoot up and float down, whereas price can go up or down with the same velocity. So, you, you know, this is why, uh, the, like we've been talking for the last like week, this has kind of been a trader's market you've had. You've had prices go up and down while vol has remained, you know, steadily increasing. Sure. Sure. It's that divergence where on short periods of time, you know, these can go opposite directions, but when you have tails, they both go to the tails. And that means volatility explodes to the upside, prices explode to the downside. 